Okay, recording has started. Um, so our tour guide today is Hugh Weldon. Hugh is our campus horticulturist um, and all around plant guru. Uh, if you've ever had the opportunity, the pleasure to speak with, with Hugh about the trees or plants on campus before, you definitely know he's a wealth of knowledge. Um, so I'm really excited that he was able to make this work um, and, uh, and share all of his knowledge with, with you. And so with that, I am going to start our tour. Let's see here. All right. Hugh, can you see everything? Yep. See it fine. Thank you. Great. Hello, everyone, and welcome. Happy Mother's Day to all the mothers out there. And happy Earth Day and Arbor Day. We were hoping to get this done for Arbor Day, but that fell on Earth Week, as it usually does. And uh, we just thought it'd be great, better to push this off a little bit. There was so much going on. Uh, on Arbor Day. So welcome and I want to thank Liesl for putting this together and also I want to thank my student helper from last year, Sabrina Feinberg. She put a lot of fun facts together for me to, so we can share in this tour and also Scott Wade, a great arborist who actually came on campus last year and measured a lot of our champion trees. So I'll be throwing in some of those notes here and there also. Okay, uh, so we're ready to get started. Tree Campus USA, uh, which we're a member of for the past four years, and we just got a re-certificate for this year. So, uh, we'll start off, we're going to try and keep to the tours that are, the trees that are on the tour, but we've been going a little off here and there for some of the other spectacular trees. So we'll start with these ones. These are our two bur oaks on Campus Green, which we believe are the two oldest trees on campus. They're uh, not as fast growing as some of the other trees, so they're not quite as big. We have uh, lightning protection installed in one of them because they <laughs> are not just tallest, some of the tallest trees on campus, they're also in the center and one of the highest points, not just on campus, but in the county or at least in the region, uh, township. So we have the uh, protection in some and we also have some rods holding trees together. Uh, so a lot of these photographs are taken over the last couple of weeks. So the leaves are just breaking out. Some of the flowers are out. So there'll be different phases of them. So that's our two bur oaks. Uh, the next one we have coming up is our American larch. So a nice fluffy green color in it this time of the year. Uh, this turns a yellow in the fall and then drops its needles. Even though it is a conifer, it does drop its needles. And we get some calls every year about why, why the pine tree is dying. Obviously it's not a pine, it's a larch, but it's hard to tell from a distance and you get some calls. So American larch, pine tree. Our beautiful paper bark maple in the corner of Austin. Uh, lovely shape to it. This gets little or no pruning, but it's a lovely lollipop shape and the bark peeling off is definitely uh, one of the hot features of it. Uh, can be confused with the birches sometimes, but it's a paper bark maple. The leaves don't look like a maple, but uh, yeah, it is. Uh, great, great tree for a small area, courtyard. This is about 25 years old, this tree. So you can see it's not very big. Uh, our evergreen magnolia. We put the small one in there. It's a small cultivar again on the corner of Austin. And the bigger one is at Barclay Hall. There is also a monster one down in front of Stanford, if anybody's familiar with that area. Uh, it's one of the biggest ones I know of in the area. Lovely evergreen tree, uh, nice, huge, big, beautiful, scattered flowers on it throughout the summer, late spring, early summer. Uh, can be a little temperate. You get some winds and ice on it. They can lose a lot and get some damage to them. But once they get established, they're pretty tough and hardy. You know, see them a lot of times in the southern states uh, and big monster ones down there because of the better weather. So some, but some of the newer varieties, cultivars are definitely tougher and hardier. So our next one is a Sweet Bay Magnolia, just breaking out into leaf, uh, has some flower buds on it. It's, uh, it's a native, semi deciduous here. So if it's in a sheltered spot, it'll hold some leaves. And if it's not, it'll most often lose its leaves. But the flowers 
um, are definitely sweet. That's the name of sweet bay. They're heavenly scented. I'll often pick one or two and just put it in a saucer of water and leave it in the room and it'll really uh, fill up the room. Fra very fragrant. Uh, these, this one is right uh, in the corner of Austin again, but the next one is back in a different corner. Very sheltered. These two pictures are taken the same day. You can see the difference of the leaves and uh, how many leaves they hold when they're more sheltered. Uh, uh, flowering dogwood, native dogwood. Again, we're moving around the side of Austin. Uh, this one has pink flowers. There is one, some with white flowers. Both of them are the same. Flowering dogwood, Cornus, Florida. Those white ones are over near the maintenance building, maintenance drive. Uh, taken almost the same day. They don't, they are a, a native tree, but they like the edge of the woods, but they like the morning sun to burn off any moisture off the leaves so they don't get diseases such as powdery mildew and such. Uh, some of the newer varieties are resistant, uh, very easy to find in the nurseries and garden centers. Uh, get a lot of questions on this one on the tour. Ginkgo biloba, it's a beautiful big old specimen. They do last for hundreds of years. Uh, this is a living fossil. Uh, dates back to 270 million years. So it's essentially a living fossil. This tree can live for over 3,000 years. Uh, often used in herbal medicine, shown promise in researching for preventing death in neurons in the brain, increasing blood supply. Uh, the fruit, when the fruit come on it, they drop in late fall and they stink to high heaven. Uh, if you walk on them crushing, bring it, into, bring it into the house in your shoes or into the office, it's quite disgusting. But uh, it can be boiled to make a soup, believe it or not. I've never tried it and won't be trying it anytime in the near future. The leaves are distinct on it. So the leaves, uh, if you look closely, when you, whenever you see the leaves on it, you can see veins in it. So the experts believe those veins are actually a pine needle, like a, a needle, like a pine, and fused together over millennia. The leaves are turn a beautiful yellow color in the fall and hold it for weeks at a time, but then like 90% of them will drop overnight, just a sudden temperature drop or wind or whatever. They are heavy and tough to clean up, hard to blow, hard to rake. So, uh, but uh, back to the fruit, actually, a lot of the newer cultivars are male, so you can. Uh, Select them, they select the male cultivars now before they sell them. Uh, and anything that has a name on it is a male. Uh, the other they are tough and hardy, very pollution tolerant, great for cities. Uh, they take a beating and the pollution. Uh, and there is some upright varieties so they don't have to spread as much, so it'll be good street trees. That one actually, the notes on that one. Uh -huh. That one tree is uh, 76 foot high and 66 foot spread. It is currently listed uh, as a 12th in the state. It's the biggest tree, so 12th biggest ginkgo in the state in Pennsylvania. Okay. Yep, move on. American Linden, shade in the grotto and the cemetery, which is great. There's, we have little leaf lindens on campus, but this is American linden of basswood. Uh, tough, hardy wood, large leaves on it, great fruit, small kind of insignificant, but a lot of them. Uh, this one is cabled up also, there's steel cables up in it to hold it together. We watched it over the years, it was kind of twisting, turning in the wind, so we didn't want to, uh, didn't want to lose that one. That is another champion to the American. So this tree, that tree spread is 72, height is 83 foot high. And it's currently list, ranked third in the state. So that is definitely one that we should be keeping an eye on, trying to keep. Uh, uh, so we have pruned it a little bit, just deadwooded more or less over the years. So third biggest American linen in the state. Uh, Tricolored beach. Uh, we have a lot of beaches on campus. We're going to come along some more as we go along. Uh, any of the named varieties or cultivars are all European beach. This one is a beautiful tricolor. I've watched this one grow over the years. Uh, 
Uh, it was pretty new when I got to campus 25 years ago, and watched it grow. I'd often mow Austin Field and go up and check on it, just check out the colors. It's just a tinge of red, pinkish there now, and it gets some white and green in it also. Uh, this was taken on Monday. Uh, what I found really great about this, I watched that tree for 23 years. And then two years ago on a tour, I really checked out and looked at the label on it. Donation, uh, uh, planted by Pendel, in memory of Jeffrey Mullen. He was very significant in the ISA chapter. And uh, I looked at it and looked at it and then dawned on me, April 28, 1993. What's special about that day? That was the first day I landed in the United States. And I'd watched the tree for 23 years and never caught on. So now I kind of pointed out every chance I get. Uh, okay. So, uh, we threw this one in here for the crab apples are coming up next. And um, crab apples in front of Austin earlier this week, late last week, were spectacular. And just a nice shot, nice color with the building in the background. Yeah, crab apple orchard in front of the church. Most of you remember the old orchard and the parking lot across the street. So a landscape architect had the idea of planting the old orchard so that the steeples when the crab apples in Florida steeples would look like they're up on uh, clouds, white puffy clouds. So that was the idea. And when the bridge was built, they had to be removed and we replanted with a, a hardier variety, more resistant to apple scab and diseases. Uh, uh, planted very similarly. And that's another shot of them from, from looking out at the church and the pedestrian bridge. Uh, these will fill in nicely over the years. And great fruit on them. They hold the fruit well into the winter. They uh, great for birds. You'll often see flocks of robins and different things eat, eating them late in the winter. I'm saying uh, our beaches, all, not all European, but all the ones on the list are. Uh, this is the Copper Beach, another tough, hardy one. We are losing some of our big beaches to beach bark disease. Uh, it doesn't help when people carve their names on them. Uh, they try to let them grow as naturally as possible, just deadwooding. Uh, um, often pointed out along Lancaster Avenue as people driving by wanting to check them out. Uh, we had this one measured, but it is, because the branches are so low, it's considered a multi-stemmed one. So it wouldn't be considered for state champion, but we do have, do have it measured. Find it here. Too many, too many notes. Yeah, this one. Yeah, what if it, it is listed currently as sixth biggest in the state? So, just the root flare on it is magnificent too. Like I said, we're losing them to beach bark disease. It gets in there, little black dots one year, larger dots the next. After about three or four years, you just start losing big chunks of the bark and it dies off. So we are treating it, but it doesn't, it helps, but it doesn't keep it off altogether. Uh, Deodar cedar, uh, another conifer, nice soft needles on it, real easy to touch. Uh, this one is large enough again to be a channel, and currently ranked ninth in the state. So uh, it's like a living Christmas tree, almost the shape of it, which is good. Uh, it's native to the Western Himal Himalayan mountains. Its local name, which in Sanskrit means divine wood or timber of the gods. So it can be used as an insect repellent when distilled into an oil. Uh, uh, that's another beech tree there behind it. That's a rotundifolia round copper beech. And uh, like I said, we do have one American beach on campus. It's down behind, down on the main drive near Campus Corner and some over in the woods on West Campus. Uh, you don't want to leave out the American, uh, American beaches. So this great specimen is Don Redwood. It's a beautiful conifer, nicely shaped. It is a deciduous conifer again. And uh, it's got a nice height to it there. Beautiful furrows in the bark when you're up close to it. And as you can see by the label, this was planted in 1954 by 
Reverend John Klaklake, who I believe was the president at the time. So this tree has a little story to it too. Over the years, I was told for like 20 odd years that it's a, it's a living fossil. It was found in China also. They, they had him fossils, but they found it out. Uh, an expedition found it in, out in China. And they didn't bring back any cuttings or seedlings from it. It was found in 40, 1945. So the expedition ended due to the, uh, the war outbreak. Was not, not the outbreak, but due to the war. Actually, found it in 1941, and then they had to come back because of the war. And then they went back in 1945 and they brought uh, cones back with them and they grew them. And this one we were told was grown in Morris Arboretum and given to the university as a gift. So, but it was, it was grown and then seedlings and then the seedlings of the first group was given to the university. That was a story I'd heard over the years. A couple of years ago, I spoke with Morris Arboretum about it and they said, if we planted in 56, we didn't have time to grow it, get seedlings from that one, and give you the second generation. That's not enough time. You must have one of the first ones. Uh, and with the measurements on it, it, it uh, it's not the biggest one in the region, but that's okay. We've got one of the oldest ones. Uh, that one. Now I have info on here. Just a moment. Yeah, so that one is a height of 83 feet, a spread of 51 feet, and it's currently listed as sixth in the state. So I think it's a, a beauty. We have some other ones on campus people point out, but that's the oldest one. Okay. Uh, beautiful Weeping Beach. Uh, you can never walk by this one without mentioning or checking it out. Uh, another European beach, obviously. Uh, a lot of people hang out in underneath there, students and staff. Alumni often come back and check it out. Uh, a lot of names carved in it, unfortunately. We're hoping to get a sign up there soon asking people not to carve their names in it. Uh, the bark is very thin and easily cut into, but uh, it's not good for the tree. Another one susceptible to the beech bark disease. The branches weep down, and when they touch into the ground, it takes a few years, but they'll often root in. And when they root in, to, they'll come back out even bigger than where they rooted in. You can see the size of that branch there. It's going into the ground, it's small, and as it comes out, it's like three times the size. So rooting in and then colonizing the area. Uh, and just another great specimen on campus. See if you have any on that one. No. Uh, and Heritage River birch. Great river birch. I don't know which came first, the Heritage River birch there or the Heritage Room for the monastery. Uh, river birch, but there's no river nearby. But they're really succeeding there because heritage and dura heat are two great varieties that can handle the, the drought. We do prune these back maybe every five or six years, take some weight off the limbs because snow and ice will often attach to them and weigh them down and they just snap off. So they try to keep, keep some of the weight off from there. Uh, the bark on it is nice and peeling like the river birches do, similar to the paper bark maple. And then those little yellow catkins hanging down on them this time of the year, kind of cool looking. Japanese cedars, so I like to call them pom pom trees. Sometimes you know, they stick out like pom poms. Uh, tough, hardy, and uh, do get some brown spots in them over the winter. But there are some newer cultivars. Radicans is one. You have that up there. At the rear of Kennedy, and just nice evergreen, good for creating hedges and screens, or out on their own as a specimen tree too. Nice conifer. That's the radicans there. Got some other newer cultivars even that are not disease tolerant, resistant. 
Okay. Uh, measles favorite, okay. Katsura tree. Uh, Katsura tree. What's about that? So Katsura in German actually means translate to cake tree because the chemical in Katsura tree smells like cotton candy and is molotov, which is used in industry as a flavor enhancer. Uh, when you get in underneath there in the fall, as the leaves drop, they smell like cotton candy. Uh, you can pick them up and crush them and smell them. You, you can just walk them through them when they're down heavy. It's really nice. Uh, we put a nice picnic bench under there. Uh, it's a nice shaded spot, but also so students can pick up the scent. So you and staff when they're out having a picnic or their lunch. Uh, uh, there's another variety out, uh, red fox. So the leaves are red on it. There's a smaller specimen up the the side of SAC Garage. Can you check that? It's red, different. Uh, the lovely, great fall color in this one too, and nice yellow leaves. Uh, hemlock, Eastern hemlock, are often called Canadian hemlock. Nice evergreen tree. They were very popular years ago, often planted as specimens and hedges, often trimmed into hedges, but they are getting devastated by a tiny insect. You can see the little white insect on the back of the needles called woolly adelgid, hemlock woolly adelgid, and that just sucks the life out of the needles. Um, around here it's devastating them unless they're treated. They're often treated with horticultural oil but it's hard to spray large trees with horticultural oil without getting it drifting all over cars and windows and office windows. So, uh, a little difficult to treat but not, not impossible. It is our state tree also, Pennsylvania state tree, and above Route 80, it, the, the woolly adagid doesn't like the weather up there. It likes the warm, moist, humid summers here. But once you get up above Route 80, you see better specimens, older ones, uh, where they're not affected. Uh, pawpaw tree. Uh, this one's right in the corner of Tolentine. There's another one over near Whitehall. Uh, just into flower this past two weeks. Uh, it's got a different kind of flower to it. Hangs upside down. Uh, starts off purplish, dark, nice dark purple, and then turns kind of greenish and blends in as the leaves open out. Uh, it's the largest native fruit in North America, uh, almost like big banana or large, you know, Sorry about that. It uh, has a lovely taste to it. It's like a banana custardy taste. And uh, I haven't tried it myself yet, but it's supposed to be delicious. But it doesn't have a great shelf life. That's, uh, they're not really grown commercially because they don't have a great shelf life. Really have to be eaten maybe hours, definitely within a day of being picked. They turn to mush after that. Uh, uh, they do sucker up and colonize too, which is great. And that's kind of best where to grow and get more fruit if we need, let them grow colonized and not as a single specimen. This particular one, uh, my former boss, who was the old horticulturist, uh, horticulturist on campus, Chuck Leeds, many of you may remember him. He got little tiny ones in year, many years ago, 20 odd years ago, and he grew them out on West Campus in a little nursery we had. And after he moved on, uh, crew came to him and said, we've got these great black magnolias, black flowers, or, and total magnolias. We should move them up onto campus. They're big enough to move now. I'm like, okay, yeah, because the leaves look like magnolias, and kind of flower too, smaller. But, but we moved them up, and then it was later on that I found out that uh, professor actually said, where are, my, where are the pawpaws gone? Why did he move them? So that's when we realized that uh, these weren't black magnolias, they're pawpaws. White pine, and this spot we normally talk about limber pines, which are near Whitehall, which are great trees too, but not, you know, great specimens. This is a great white pine specimen, beautiful tree, native. Pines are often planted as a screen tree in new properties, but as they grow up, they lose the lower branches and don't become screens anymore, just large, beautiful trees. Uh, what I like about this one is I'd seen red hawks, red-tailed hawks nesting in this, and also nesting in the ones at Stonehall 
and TSB over the years. So they like white pines, large specimens where they can nest way up high, away from the squirrels, or they can see the squirrels climbing a tree and they can protect their eggs and young. Okay. This little guy, uh, Frankelinia tree. So Frankelinia tree is native to Georgia. It was found, yes, found around 1800 by a gentleman called William Bartram, who was Bartram's Gardens down in the city. Him and his son went on expeditions around the country collecting seeds and samples of different trees. He got this one down in Georgia along the Altamaha River, so it's called Frankelinia Altamaha. And when they went back to find it again, they could never found again in the wild. So all the specimens ever grown uh, are from that one expedition. They're not sure 100% what happened in the wild with them, but they believe that it was something to do with cotton, some disease the cotton carried wiped them out, so the cotton plantations. Uh, they're very difficult to transplant, very difficult to get established, but once the, the uh, the ones we planted on campus, this one's at Whitehall. There's another specimen right between Alumni and St. Rita's. And the leaves come out late, and then the flowers just sporadic over the summer. Then nice white flowers that often see bees on them. But when you plant them, the, the first year will often have a big dieback right in the center of the plant. And they, because they're kind of a bushy tree, but they'll often recover, but it just takes time before they become a nice specimen. So, sorry, we'll go back to that one real quick. So that, it was named Franklin because of uh, Benjamin Franklin was a good friend of Bartram's. And Bartram Garden ran a tree census in 1999 and tried to locate all the Franklin species. Uh, uh, went extinct in the wild in 1803. Uh, This guy again isn't a tree, it's mountain laurel. Not even maybe familiar with it. If you're woods, you'll see fast patches of it in the woods. Beautiful evergreen, nice flowers coming on it. Uh, it's, this is an older specimen on campus, but you've seen much bigger ones in the wild. It is our native shrub. Sorry, not our native shrub, our state shrub. So it is native, but it's the Pennsylvania state shrub, so we wanted to throw it in there. And a lot of newer varieties, disease resistant, but a lot of different colors in them. Multicolors, pinks, reds, whites. Uh, uh, the deer, deer are fond of them. That's one of our biggest drawbacks. But very little the deer don't eat. Right. Mendel Field. We have a big collection of oaks on Mendel Field. Right around them, we've got shingle oak, English oak, uh, sawtooth oak, willow oaks. Mm, several others, just a nice collection of oaks here. Uh, not sure, this one is a little lopsided because with the, it was shaded out from a different oak that had, was diseased as a, a big pin, large pin oaks. Another variety was there and that was shading it along one side. So this hopefully will fill back in. Uh, another big one. Uh, I believe this one is sawtooth oak, right in front of the mandor. Just you can see the, the shape of them there, the structure of them before the leaves come out. Well, always can be admired in any any time of the year. Uh, white fringe tree. So we've two kinds: we've uh, white fringe tree and Chinese fringe tree on campus. Uh, uh, another late leafer out, but. The flowers come out pretty early. They usually flower around graduation, so we'd often get them in for graduation and use them as just a nice entrance way into the stadium. And then we'd plant them out on campus. Uh, another name for that is old man's beard, because the, as the flowers grow more and more, they'll hang down uh, and look like an old man's beard. Uh, a tough, hardy native tree. And smaller grown, shrubby looking. Uh, so in this one we have several trees, but 
It was originally taken for the large American hollies, which right in front of Falvey here, limbed up a little bit so they don't poke people's eyes out. But great evergreen tree when they're like grown into a tree. Also nice to feed the birds with, berries. Uh, great place for the birds to hang out in the winter with some shelter uh, away from the brutal winds. And we have a nice picture of another white dogwood there. We have some great specimens of them on campus and some newer ones coming on, which uh, are very disease resistant, mildew resistant. And then we have a little yellow magnolia coming in there. So again, a yellow magnolia had to be removed for, for the new site plan of Mendel Field. And uh, we kept one bit large one there called Yellow Bird. That's a yellow bird. Uh, you see, it's really magnificent. This was about last week. And then the, the smaller flower there is actually, when they removed one, I talked to the landscape architect that was watching over our trees during the construction. And I said, well, if you're replacing magnolia, yellow magnolia, I'd like you to get Judy Zuck, variety called Judy Zuck. And she said, absolutely, I will try. It's a hard to get, but I will absolutely try and get you one because I studied under her. She was the director for the culture at Brooklyn Botanical Gardens. So she was really interested in getting one nice and well. I have one on hold in a nursery, so I'll get that to you if nothing else. So she got one and I got one. So we have, now we have two Judy Zucks on campus. So just a nice deep yellow flower compared to the yellow bird, which is also beautiful. Okay. These are from spending too much time, move me along. Another magnolia, the saucer magnolia here at uh, here in front of Tolentine. Uh, we've got saucer and star magnolias on campus, plus some hybrids. And um, this one's beautiful. And I couldn't help but catch a glimpse of the squirrel. It took me five minutes. He was jumping around all over the place. <laughs> uh, I like. I don't care too much for the squirrels. I think they're great uh, hawk food though. <laughs> Another great reason for trees. This guy's China fir, common China fir. Uh, several specimens along the side of SAC. China fir is considered a cradle to grave tree in China. It's the second most popular timber after bamboo, if you consider bamboo a timber. It's used for anything from building cradles, kitchen cabinets, furniture, beds, right up to the uh, right up to coffins, uh, cradle to grave tree. Very difficult to work with it. Needles are very uh, sharp. If you, uh, the crew don't like to be raking them and working with them underneath. Uh, uh, tough to deal, handle with. But we did get a nice shot of the lilacs are just coming into bloom on campus too. So this, the lilac is actually here at Mendel, looking across at SAC. Uh, let's see if I missed anything on that one. That's all I have on that one. This guy is the Japanese cut leaf maple. Uh, a lot of different kinds of Japanese maples out there, Jap maple as they call them in the industry. This one's cut leaf, you can see how fine the leaves are. This one comes out reddish and stays red throughout the summer, turns lovely fall colors, fall colors like the spring color. Uh, nice small, lower grown, nice for courtyards. Uh, different varieties can come out green and turn red in the fall. Uh, other ones are green and then turn yellow in the fall. But this one's a really beautiful one. Uh, great spot for it right in the corner there, sheltered. Uh, beautiful structure to it in the winter time too. If you look at it and check it out in the winter, the structure is magnificent. Great to see. Uh, there's the other picture, the common chant for. That's a little smaller one. This was a seedling off the large one that we let grow in. There you can see the cones on the top of it there. Our yellow wood. Uh, we have a couple of specimens on campus. This is the oldest in front of SAC. Um, and it's called yellow wood because you, if you cut that wood, it is a bright yellow and it's got a distinctive smell to it also. Uh, a few years ago, I noticed the one, there was two side by side there. And 
came by one day and noticed there was something iffy about it. Uh, there's a new beetle coming on called Ambrosia beetle and pushes out the frass and it looks like little toothpicks sticking out of it and the tree was covered in it. And it often like, constantly attacked the same tree. They'd be all attracted to one tree and it was killing it. So we took it down very quickly and destroyed the wood, took the wood actually to the incinerator instead of chipping it and leaving it on West Campus. Uh, we did replace it with a smaller one and it got damaged the first winter. So we're trying to either grow that one up or replace it with a, another taller stem tree. Red buds, Eastern red buds, beautiful. We've got these all over campus. Uh, right here in the quad. But nice native tree, another edge of the woods tree. That was, doesn't, um, doesn't like deep shade, but it will take some shade. It doesn't like the full sun. It gets scorched in the summertime. We've got a multitude of many different new cultivars coming on with white spotted in the leaves. Uh, some yellowy, orangey colors in the leaves throughout the whole year. Here's a uh, nice older specimen here. This one has got to be 30 years old. Corner of SAC. Uh, another nice tree for a small, small yard. They do reseed a little bit, but they can be controlled. They are native, though. they're not an invasive. Uh, yeah, just different places around around the campus that we have them. So, uh, yeah, there in front of health services building. And some of the newer varieties even are darker reddish colors to them. Uh, and there's one oxymoron now, which is, it's a white flowering red bud. Uh, there's Ruby Falls, a uh, nice weeping one, darker reddish flowers to it, just breaking out last week. But nice heavy leaves to it. Yeah, there it is. There's a white one. These were planted recently up in front of St. Rita's and around the church. White flowering redbuds. This is one of my favorites here, right in the corner of Alumni. Uh, it's just an old gnarly looking redbud. It was looking pretty nice. Uh, when a construction trucks backed into it and took a big chunk out of it, large branch or bough, but it still, still looks great. And I'll twist it up and gnarly. Selkova in front of SAC. Selkova's got popular about 30, 40 years ago. Uh, planted because of the nice shape of them, nice vase shape. Op open tree, nice shade tree, street trees. Uh, they're, they're Asian again. They don't do anything for me. Not a great flower on them. The bark is a little interesting, a little spotted, but that's about it. I think there's plenty of nice native trees that could be, could be used instead of it. This one is on its last legs. Sycamores, uh, these ones are on behind core. Uh, another great native tree. You see, often see them growing along the banks of rivers. They're like there, but they'll take a lot of different situations. Really stand out in the winter time with the white on the bark. Some trees more than others. A lot especially the older ones, because they're grown from seed. So, uh, cross with the European one. Yeah, you have a, uh, it'll come to me in a moment. Uh, but they are London plain. Cross with a London plain, they get much whiter bark to them and a lot more tough disease tolerant and pollution tolerant. London, because they developed it for pollution in London back in the industrial age. So they crossed it. Uh, but they are a messy tree. They will drop their leaves or leaves and small branches throughout the whole summer. So if you have a big garden or an open area, good for it. But the more will collect, you will hit a lot of those little branches. So good for parks and areas like that. We do have a monster specimen over on West Campus, along the creek in West Campus. I have some info on that one here. Uh, yep. Um, it's it's big. It's 84 foot high and a spread of 116 feet. But well, we thought it was huge and might be state champion. So it's 59th in the state. But, but, but it's because there's so many of them. 
and they're often planted and let grow huge because they, when they're planting them, they know how big they are, how much space they need. So that's why they have so many. Our American elms. So after the chestnuts got wiped out, with the chestnut blight, a lot of elms were planted as shade trees, uh, street trees. And then in the 70s, I believe, they were wiped out with the Dutch elm disease. And after that wiping out, there was a few new cultivars developed. This one is Princeton from Princeton Nurseries, New Jersey. It, uh, these are disease retolerant. Dutch elm disease retolerant, but are resistant and tolerant, but not completely. And what we found, we planted a few of these around campus, uh, up in the ellipse area where this one is in front of Connolly, and also in the quad for shade. But the last couple of years, we've had a lot of wind damage on them when they're pretty young. So uh, we pruned them drastically this year to try to open it up a little bit and let some of that wind through. Um, hopefully it won't break quite as easily. We have to replace several of them near core where this picture was taken from that angle. American mm -hmm. sweet gum. This is our biggest one on main campus. Uh, corner of core hall there. Sweet gums are nice and they're native, but biggest drawback is the is the gumballs. Anybody who's ever had them or lived around them, trying to walk on them is difficult. Trying to clean them up, rake them, blow them, difficult. But uh, there is a lot of new varieties out now. Again, male varieties, and that don't uh, they're male, so they don't have the sweet gum. So they do get a great fall color, anything from yellow to purple to reds in them. And there's upright ones now that can be planted in, in tighter spots. There's a couple right in the corner of the quad, closer to Connolly. Uh, uh, yeah, just a, another great tree. This one got some damage with the new walkways around there. Some of the roots were cut, so we're hoping it survives. It's been a few years, so it's trying to bounce back. Yeah. Yeah. What do we got up next? The thornless honey locusts. So these guys are all through, right here in front of Doherty Hall. And they go down through the Connolly Plaza. Um, Great shade tree, just light filter shade because they got such small little leaves or leaflets on them. Um, nice, and the leaves are easy to clean up and they'll often blow away, so uh, really easy to clean up that way. And the, you can see a picture of the Oreo there. It's still not back yet, but they're working on it. Uh, so that one's thornless. The reason that was developed was because if you look closely on this one, you see the thorns up on the top left there, uh, they go right up through the trunk. So if you see those little leaves breaking out on the, on the trunk, the, we clean, the ground screw cleans them off several times a year because you get huge six inch, six, eight inch thorns sticking out of them. And anybody playing ball or frisbee in there if it runs into that tree, they'd be stabbed. Uh, uh, but another great native tree, tough, hardy wood to it. Oh, the, uh, the wood makers like using that. Uh, drought resistant, tolerant, and rot resistant wood to it. Uh, that's uh, that's our owner's name. So, a couple of other quick, that's the end of the tour, but a couple of other quick things to mention here is a red maple collection. Beautiful, lots of red maples. Fetig and Gate here. You can see the colors in them just of the leaves and the, and the flowers in them this time of the year are nice. And our shaded grotto. So that's the other side of our American linden or basswood, shading the grotto, and another specimen of the dawn redwood there. And thank you and happy Mother's Day. And don't be afraid to plant more trees. Always looking out to plant more trees for birds and insects and be shaded out. So thank you everyone for attending. It's great to see some of your faces there. Lots of people recognize. So and I feel very lucky I can be on campus a couple of days a week this time of the year and uh, checking it out and getting some nice photographs. Uh, it'll still be here when you all get back, <laughs> hopefully looking better than ever. Uh -huh.
Thank you. And Thank take you care. so much, Hugh. That was really fantastic. Um, I always learn something when I uh, join Hugh on a tour, and I've done like a dozen with you now. So it, it's really a testament to your knowledge that I can continue to learn. That or I'm not listening, one of the two. <laughs> um, so, you know, we have a few minutes. Uh, I'm really impressed, Hugh. You, you nailed that on timing. Um, so if anyone has any questions about the trees they saw, uh, or even other trees on campus that you have questions about, um, you can ask those now. Um, I also say I'm going to email all of you um, after this tour. Hugh and I were playing around with the idea of doing smaller weekly tours that would maybe be more specialized based off an area of campus or a type of plant or, or anything else that you guys might think of. So if, if you have suggestions of the types of information that you'd be looking for, it'd be great to hear from you um, as, we, as we think to put those together. Does I've anyone often been have any asked, uh, what's my favorite tree on campus? And, uh, you know, being Mother's Day, it can't be, uh, how can I say I have a favorite? It's like saying, what's your favorite baby, you know? If you have <laughs> multiple babies, like, who's your favorite? Like, there's so many favorites on campus, so many favorite trees, I couldn't pick one over the other, so. Lisa, uh, uh, you have a question on the cedar that's in front of the monastery uh, it, on facing uh, Lancaster. I was told that that was planted in memory of John Rotel, an Augustinian. Uh, and it's a beautiful tree. And every time I walk by it, I think of John, who was one of my formation directors. Do you know, would it be 20, 20 years, less than 20 years old? Yes. I, I might I vaguely remember that being planted. Okay. I wasn't I wasn't aware that it was a dedicated tree, but uh, yeah, it is a, right around 20 years, I would think. Mm -hmm. uh, it is a beautiful specimen. Oh, beautiful, thank but you. I will, I will definitely remember that moving forward. And if, if you could email me that information so I could put it in maybe on the next tour. Sure. Uh, and mention them, that would be great. I was there for that dedication, so I think that Kale Ellis might have a whole history of that. Yeah. Uh, great. I'll, I'll ask Kale. Yeah. Good. Thanks, Beth. You're welcome. The, the other question I would have for Dr. Ellis, or Father Ellis, would be the cut leaf maple. I'd heard rumors that was planted by Father Canuli. If I'm pronouncing that right. Uh, I'd like to find out if that's true or not. I can reach out to Father Kale also. Okay, well, if there are no other questions, we'll end the tour now. You, of course, can always contact myself or Hugh if you have follow-up questions um, at any point in time, whether it's about this tour or any other plant you see on campus. We so enjoy you joining us for this tour and a really happy Mother's Day to all of you and all of your mothers um, and the mothers in your life. Thank, thank you all. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you so much.